much as possible. Now, over here, what you see over here is Mari's, uh, some of Mari's video monitors. Paul Mouget over there is in charge of uh, taping films for Mari on TV. So, Paul is just different hours when he comes in to program all those machines. So I don't know if he wants to explain to you, it all depends on how he feels like it. <laughs> Paul, you want to explain to them how those monitors work? Besides putting power on? Oh, I program this. I'll turn it back on. Through, throughout the week, Marty will give me a list of the films that he wants to watch, to view. Um, it's his fanaticism. I think it's his baby, which is great because it gives me a job. Um, I set my own hours. I come in whenever I can to program and to check, transfer, to catalog, to cross-reference, etc., etc. It's a library, just like a book librarian. Uh, right now, I'm just checking to make sure they're heads and tails and that the reception is good enough so that Marty can see it. Um, he'll call up and, and say, I want to see this scene or this film. Will you queue it up for me? Can you, you want to show my catalog works? Sure. <laughs> I mean, for instance, when Marty was uh, shooting his Mirror Mirror episode for Steve Spielberg, uh, he will call and say, I need uh, usually one of the Dracula movies like horror of Dracula's. Right. And Paul would have to Which he like, loves, the old Hammer films. Yeah. You know, the house that dripped blood and, and those sort of Saturday afternoon hangover movies that you watch that are, are low production values. They made very quickly. A lot of them had to do with Roger Corman, who was one of the men who first gave Marty a, a chance. <laughs> a job. Boxcar Bertha. Roger Corman was behind that. But this is where all the tapes are listed. Um, we're in the process of getting a computer so that it makes it easier because Marty is a list man. He likes everything to be written down. I mean, Raphael keeps just tons and tons and tons of papers. Um, in here, everything's listed by title. These eight uh, containers hold index cards. Each one has one film on it. Uh, I think we're up to about 8,000 titles. So, Pride of the Yankees. Um, that's the number of the tape that it's on. There's a, a, a library downstairs where we keep all the tapes. And he wants to know the director and if it has commercials or not, or if I transferred it for three-quarter inch, from three-quarter inch, half inch, um, and, and what channel it came from, and when we got it. Now, if this movie comes up again, and Marty might want to see it, possibly we can get a better copy. For instance, with this TNT and Ted Turner, they've struck a lot of new prints, and it's a lot better quality than what we have already. So I'll tape it and run it up against the old one and see which copy is clearer or is cut. And then again, lay it on Marty's desk so he can watch it. Take it home and watch films all night long. In 1979, uh, we got these Polaroids, and we um, Polaroided everything that we did, including our lunches and everybody who came in the room, uh, the hotel rooms we were in. We have about 3,000 Polaroids in that period, 79 to 80 to 81. I'll say that's too much. Take some tonight, my parents. And now we go into the Ray Charles scene, right? Let 
but later, I guess. Well, hurry up with that shit, huh? I wanted to ask you, you know, what was it you were trying to do in films of the 70s that the films of the 40s didn't? How are you trying to do it differently? Well, that, that, two different, that's two different answers to that. The first thing is that, I mean, my whole fascination with Hollywood films go, goes way back. So that in films like Mean Streets, for example, Mean Streets is very much in the tradition of the gangster film, of Underworld and uh, uh, Scarface, uh, Public Enemy and um, the Roaring Twenties. Mainly Public Enemy and the Roaring Twenties. Uh, because I only saw Underworld recently, a couple of years ago, and Scarface, we never got to see in America because the, the, tile, the, the rights were held up until Hughes died, and then now we're able to see it, but I saw it about 10 years ago for the first time, uh, several years after I made uh, uh, Mean Streets. But what I mean in the tradition, what I mean by being in the tradition of the, uh, of the gangster film is, that, is the inspiration. The inspiration is very much in pictures like Public Enemy and... Uh, uh, Roaring Twenties. So that's why I was very pleased. Lord, um, that, that, that's why Mean Streets not worthy to eat your flesh. deals with um, not that worthy level to drink your blood. of uh, not worthy to drink small time hoods. Uh, but I was very pleased when Warner Brothers bought it okay, because it was in the tradition of the Warner Brothers gangster pictures. Yes. It was an homage, in a sense, to the Warner Brothers gangster pictures. But um, the main the main reason for it, of course, was it was my own uh, semi autobiographical film. So uh, it just happened to fall into place with. If anything, what genre? Yes. The gangster genre. Right. And what was the best gangster genre? Warner Brothers. Sure. They always had, you know. Um, and um, uh, uh, New York, New York, on the other hand, by the time I got to do New York, New York, it was three years later. And I was so fascinated with uh, Hollywood films, especially the 40s. Uh, being born, I was born in 42, so my first memories were films of the 40s, and uh, vivid memories, because I remember going to the theater and seeing them vividly in uh, Three Strip Technicolor. Yeah. Uh, the, the women's lips were so bright red that, you know, they just leap out at you and uh, the flowers and uh, the musicals. Nancy goes to Rio. I mean, that was a big one for me. Yeah, you know. So, <laughs> hey, no fool <laughs> around there. Yeah, yeah that was great. Right. Nancy goes to Rio. Wonderful picture, right? I was watching it. It was, it was on TV the other morning. Again, TNT, Turner Station. Again, he has it on. Beautiful new uh, uh, master, right. video master. But in any event, um, uh, uh, New York, New York was an attempt at a, a very, very serious homage to the style of filmmaking of the 40s, into the late 40s, and at the very end of the picture, the early 50s, 52, before Cinemascope. Right. It was very, very, very specific. And I just, they gave so much to me, I wanted to, I wanted to recreate one last time something that looked like that. Um, we painted all the sets, I mean, all, we made all the sets. I got Boris Levin, I met Boris Levin through Irwin Winkler. Uh, he was a, a designer I admired so much after seeing Giant and The Silver Chalice, two films that were, were pivotal to me. Uh, and I was missing my name. I said, you are one of these people from the old time who knows how these sets were made and what they did, the scale of the set even. Um, uh, and he, he agreed, and he agreed to do it. 